can't sure. Okay, so today uh, we're gonna look more at the striking arts that are more predominantly punching, with the exception of some of the Chinese arts, which we'll look at a different, um, we'll look at next week. But um, we're gonna start with basic, with uh, boxing, right, from the West, okay? Um, and boxing, I mean, people have figured out how to hit each other for a long time, right? But um, people think back to ancient Greece when we start about, when we think about boxing, and it was part of the ancient Olympiad, and the boxers of then were the, um, uh, there was a thing called pancration, which would have been kind of more like MMA, or something like that, um, and then there was wrestling. All three were more violent than what it is, than, than certainly what we think of as today. Boxing was extremely so. Um, it was, but it was an ancient Olympic sport for both men and boys. Um, it was fought until there was winter exhaustion. There were there were no rounds. Um, even then, there it, the feats were. Um, you know, the bouts lasted for a long time. Um, there were uh, they took to making sure that the bouts, that the matches were at the like the heat of the day, right? So that basically, if you've ever been in you know the Med in, in, in met the Mediterranean in like summer, it's not exactly a you know it, it's it's not very temperate, right? So um, it would the idea was kind of wilt the fighters, right? So they all you know they the, the heat would take a toll on them too, um, and then uh, that would um, the there was, a pre there was a predominance of just big hooks and hammer fists down. Um, that at some point, if basically there wasn't a winner, and again, these matches would go on forever, but if, these, if at some point there wasn't a, a, a winner, they would basically resort to then trading uncontested blows until basically one drop. Um, such was the case between two, uh, two boxers by the name of Krugos and Damazinos, okay? Um, it lasted for hours, like I said. Um, Krugos, so then they went to uncontested blows. Krugos hit Damazinos first in the head and Damazinos took it. Um, then Damazinos warned Krugos to cover his head, but as he raised his hands, then Damazinos basically speared him in the midsection and proceeded to disembowel him and spread his entrails around the arena. They got the, the judges got together and concluded that that was a foul. And he was and then so Damazinos was disqualified and Krugos was declared the winner. Okay. So Anyway, again, a little different than the boxing we have today, okay? Um, at some point, they developed the cestus, okay? Um, and I don't, it, which basically was a hard, um, uh, they were gloves, they were, they were considered gloves, but they were more like steel knuckles, right? They weren't padding, they were to cause more damage to make the fights go Right? I don't know if there's an etymology. They were kind of like, kind of like plaster. So I don't know if this was where, like, like when cast, like when you break your arm and cast. I don't know if that's where that comes from or not. I I speculate because again, it, it kind of is more like that. Um, later on, then the Romans adopted the concept for like uh, the gladiators and things like that. They would actually put like sharp ridges, like on the knuckles, so that then when you punch you had a sharp edge to lacerate with uh, and stuff like that. So um, they could be leather wraps, they could be, but again, they weren't the soft padding that, um, you know, kind of civilizes the sport today to some degree. Again, it was designed to cause more damage and allow people to punch harder and cause more damage, right? Um, as they did it, right? Now, um, and so again, this has gone on in Europe or whatever, but then in 
the uh, more modern era, um, England became kind of is considered the birthplace of modern boxing, which is you sometimes hear as the phrase um, the manly art of self defense. Okay, um, there was um, a guy by the name of Fig that credited is credited with the boxing the prize ring, um, just like we talked about with Savat. A lot of the early um, boxing or Savat people were also um, were also very much um, uh, fencing masters, right? So Fig Fig was also a fencing master. Okay, um, Jack Broughton was also a famous figure who is credited with setting up the, is actually starting back boxing gloves and setting up rules and establishing Broughton's Code, which was really kind of the first set of sport rules to um, legitimize or kind of civilize boxing, okay? That included no hitting the opponent when they were down, no leg wrestling, which keep in mind before that was existed, okay? Um, and, and, and uh, basically gave them time to get back up if they were knocked down or whatever else, okay? And so as, is a, as a common thing um, in martial arts around the world, right, we see that, well, like it is, it goes through periods where it is more um, accepted and then where society does not really like, like it. And part of that is tied to the fact that, okay, um, violence tends to be, right, if, if you use violence, for example, criminal element, right, things like that, um, parts of society where violence is just part of more everyday life and expression and things like that, um, which is not necessarily middle-class America, but there are plenty of other places where violence is part, you know, is a valid way to, for example, if you do something wrong, violence is a part of your education. They beat you and you learn. Don't do that again. I'm gonna assume that's not how it works at your house, but there's plenty of places in the world and subcultures where that is a perfectly valid form of education, okay? So, but especially the criminal or the more violent elements or whatever, right, are attracted to things that help them be better at violence, boxing, whatever else, right? And so the tool of violence gets associated with people who use violence, right? The tool gets associated with the people, right? Even though, again, violence is a tool, right? So, um, other, you know, so other people uh, that kind of confuse the two, oh, well, I don't want to do that. That's what criminals do, right? Um, so, again, people kind of confuse the tool and the people that use it. Right. Um, so uh, you could draw parallels to, you know, today's society and the Second Amendment and gun rights. Right. Bad people do bad things with guns. So every, and so some people associate guns with bad people. Right. But I mean, it's kind of a similar argument. Right. So, but basically, um, so boxing is a perfect example. But we mentioned capoeira went through the same thing. It was at some point associated with, um, uh, you know, yeah, the slums and the gangs in the slums and things like that in, in, in Brazil. And so it was outlawed. And then later on it became basically a national sport and a, po a point of national pride, right? Depending on who embraced it, what parts of society accepted it and things like that. So boxing is no different. It, it was, it was at some points considered, again, very, you know, only criminals did it, and it was very, you know, gentlemen didn't walk around with black eyes and things like that from boxing or whatever. Um, and, you know, if you were, 
they had a royalty or whatever, then that was, you know, very, you know, not very uh, um, uh, uh, gentlemanly or gentry-like, okay? Um, and so Broughton did a lot to civilize boxing, so it would become more accepted in the general populace and even the nobility, right? And so we see the same things, where it was out of favor and it was very much in favor, okay, um, in various periods of history. Another key person to do this was the Marquis of Queensberry, who endorsed a set of rules in the amateur fight that is really still the rules of the basis of the rules today. And this was in 1866, so it's been a while later, right? But, um, and you will still sometimes hear about Queensberry rules, okay? Um, back when Mike Tyson was coming back in, um, after he, you know, did the whole thing with Holyfield, if you know that or whatever, but basically, like, you know, other people are like, would you fight Mike Tyson or whatever when he's making his comeback? Um, and people would be, and, and like I can remember uh, Lennox Lewis going, well, if he fights by Queensberry rules, then sure. Right? But in using that reference, right? So you still hear Queensberry rules used today as kind of the standard, and obviously things have evolved a little bit, okay? Similarly, in the United States, boxing, it, very much the same way. Sometimes it was legal, sometimes it wasn't. It would be outlawed in different districts or for environments, other people it wouldn't. Um, a lot of this also is tied to the prize ring, okay? And the difference between amateur boxing and professional boxing. And, um, you know, boxing uh, has had a reputation for a long time as the sport being very corrupt in terms of the money that goes in and that, you know, people throwing fights and, you know, you, you know very bad, you know, or um, uh, you know, very unscrupulous managers and things like that, right? So it's had a long history of kind of being a, a little bit of a corrupt sport. Um, but so it, would, it went through various, um, it went through various stages like that as well in the United States. Um, professional boxing oftentimes was outlawed. Um, although amateur boxing was not. And so you, you hear stories of um, some of these famous professional boxers or whatever um, who, uh, you know, they, they were considered like, you know, the heavyweight champion of the world or whatever, but then they, um, but then they would be in a place that there was no price fighting, there was no professional fighting. But the local, you know, athletic club happened to be doing a series of amateur fighting that evening and it just so happens that the heavyweight champion of the world and the number one challenger happened to be in town and get one day memberships to the athletic club so they could also participate in the in the boxing event that night right and they, so there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, uh, types of maneuvering I heard there was one account um, like the four corners in uh, in out west, right where you've got where there's in you know four different states come to come together in one corner, right? You know what I'm talking about? Yes, no, maybe. Right? So there's a, there's a spot right where every kind of you can stand in all four states at once or whatever. Okay, so you know that's kind of the same thing with counties, right? So again, um, it was illegal, but then. Of course, it had to be enforced. So there were accounts of like the boxing ring was set up in four corners, right? So that if the law, if the sheriff happened to bother to enforce the prize ring rule, and, you know, the law in one county, well, presumably not all four sheriffs were. So like basically if one sheriff showed up, then basically they could all kind of move over and every guy could stay in the other three corners of the ring where he's out of jurisdiction and can't do anything about it. I mean, it, it got kind of crazy, right? So um, anyway, so there was a lot of counts of that. Okay, It really started to become more legalized between 1915 and 1930, okay? Um, the Golden Gloves had, the, was a, um, a, the New York Daily News, the newspaper had an amateur tournament. It was actually modeled after Chicago Tribune tournament, or there was an amateur tournament. Um, it became so popular and it kind of started to help, you know, get, get, um, boxing a little more accepted. The other thing that is worth noting is the importance of um, the armed services 
in the flourishing of boxing in the United States. Okay, um, World War One and World War Two, you had a bunch of guys. And again, the, a lot of men were going coming back um, after World War One, 1915 to 1930, as after you know the period after World War One, you had a lot of soldiers where boxing was encouraged or inculcated into as part of you know your, your your training in the military in the armed services and ships had you know boxing champions that would fight for you know different you know, you know fight ship versus ship champion and stuff like that and you know it was for fighting spirit for the men supposedly correlated with Bay and F fight I'm not really sure right there were boxing manuals in in, in old school army combative things and stuff like that so it was it was embraced in the military so the so the United so then all these servicemen, all these veterans came back after the war, liking boxing, right? And so boxing then, because of its popularity with that populace, then again it becomes more generally accepted. Hey, some of these, you know, some of these uh, veterans go on to become, you know, politicians and lawmakers. So guess what? Well, I like boxing. I did boxing. I turned out okay. It's not just for criminals, right? So they started to legalize it more and things like that. Okay, um, you know, again, my 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 grandfather was a Marine in World War II, and certainly, like I can remember him, you know, the, the Saturday night fights, right, getting you know back in the day, rabbit air to TV and everything else. But he, you know, he boxed, you know, in the in the, in the Marines and kind of grew up on that back in the day, and he wanted the boxing fights or whatever. Okay, um, and you know. MMA has taken a lot of the audience from boxing. There's still people who like boxing, but it is not as popular as it was. And arguably part of that is because its audience is dying off. Right? Because the, you know, the, the, the World War II veterans are not around hardly anymore, right? They're, 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 and, and so that audience is dying off significantly, okay? Um, like I said, it is, it is boxing today as we look at it is very different than the boxing in the uh, in, in the past. Okay, here's another example of this. This is uh, so this goes back to again the um, prize ring era where again it wasn't it, it, they call it the prize ring era, but it was um, very different type of boxing. Okay, um, uh, so. Back in the day, like you would, you know, there were no really rounds either, right? As far as time rounds, a round meant you got knocked down and you got back up. That was a round, right? Because remember, according to Bratton's code, you let him get back up, right? So they draw the line on the they draw the line on the floor. You stand there, you hit each other until one person fell. You get back up. You know, you would toe the line. The phrase "toe the line," right? From you guys face off one another, okay? So this is a sports section, if you will. There really wasn't a sports section, but this is an account from a boxing quote-unquote match in Dodge City in 1877. Yeah, that Dodge City in the wild, wild west in 1877, okay? So this is in the newspaper. This is billed as a boxing match between two men named Whitman and Janley. The match began at 4.30 a.m. in the street in front of the Saratoga Saloon. What type of sporting event starts outside of a, a, a saloon at 4.30 a.m., right? During the 47th round, Red Hanley, what's a, what's a round? Someone's been knocked up and beaten down. During the 47th round, Red Hanley implored Norton, the referee, apparently there was a referee, to take uh, Nelson off for a little while till he could, um, uh, to take him off for a little while till he could have time to put his right eye back where it belonged, set his jawbone, and have the ragged edge trimmed off his ears where they had been chewed the worst. This was considered against the rules of the ring, so Norton declined, encouraged him, and encouraged him to bear it as well as he could and squeal when he got enough. 
About the 65th round, Red squealed unmistakably, and Whitman was declared the winner. The only injury sustained by the loser, the only injury sustained by the loser in the fight were two ears chewed off, one eye busted, and the other disabled. I'm not really sure what the difference is there, okay? But one eye busted and the other disabled, right cheekbone caved in, bridge of the nose broken, seven teeth knocked out, one jawbone mashed, one side of the tongue chewed off, and several other unimportant fractures and bruises. Rid retired from the ring in disgust. Not the boxing, again, we, we think of today that you go to the, you know, Indiana, you know, police and power, power um, or whatever um, today, okay? All right, so uh, basically the rules today, okay? Um, amateurs wear headgear, professionals do not. Um, one thing that if you're not familiar with that, that applies to uh, professional boxing and translates to MMA is what they call the 10 must system of scoring. So if you're not familiar with this, okay, the 10 must system of scoring, basically the winner of the round gets 10, round, 10 points. Okay? If you win the round, you get 10 points. The loser of the round then gets a score relative to the winner's 10 points. So if you get a 10-9, you might get a 10, most of the time if it's a competitive round of one person in, you know, is the winner, then it's 10-9, um, right? And you do this for each round. So if you, let's say you win two out of three rounds, then, and you get 10 points, you know, you get, ten, so let's go, so let's say you go, you know, there are three rounds and it goes 10-9, 10-9, and then the, the other person wins the last round, okay? Then this person has more points than this person, by he wins by one, right? Make sense, okay? If it's a very lopsided round, then it could be more like a 10-8 round. So usually if there's a knockdown, a couple of knockdowns, the guy almost gets knocked out by, you know, but stands back up or whatever, and it's a, it's a, it's a, dominating round, then it very well might be a 10-8 round, okay, um, or whatever. So this is the 10 must system, and then the scoring goes on. Remember, we talked about it and when we talked about sport. Nowadays, the uh, amateur, and, and I did hear they were talking about going back to this, uh, going back to the 10 must system in amateur boxing. I, to be honest, I, have, I can't tell for certain whether they officially did that or not. But remember, we talked about there for a while, if nothing else, they did it where there was just straight up points, okay? Where every, every shot was a point and you carried it over. So if I scored five points, you scored two at the end of the first round, then the score is five, two, you move on to the next round, you go on to the next round or whatever else, okay? So um, you could have two really big rounds, but then the other person could very narrowly win all the other rounds, but if you had accumulated such a point gap in the first two rounds, you'd still win the match even though you lost the majority of the rounds. Okay, so it really kind of changes how, um, it could really change how the strategy or how the scoring, the, the match plays out a little bit, okay? Um, of course, nowadays, there's no wrestling. Um, there's no, no shots to the back of the head. Uh, the punches have to be stretched places with the front. Uh, you will see a lot of times, especially in amateur nowadays, the gloves have a white part on the front of them and then the color on the back. And so that is to help the judges kind of see the part that lands, right? So again, if you, you hit with the, you know, the back fist of the glove and stuff like that. One of my favorite boxers um, was a guy by the name of Chris Bird. He, I, I thought he, he never really was like a, 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 like a big champ or anything like that. I thought he should have done better than what he did. I really liked his style. But one of the things was he would he would paw with this front hand and kind of lull you to sleep and be really annoying with it and then snap the back hand behind it. He didn't have a lot of power to finish it up. But basically, like a lot of people would claim he was throwing back fists. He was he was definitely pushing the envelope on the ruler, but a lot of people claimed a lot of his, his shots were not jabbed, but more back fists, 
this way and those were illegal and you shouldn't be doing that in, in boxing, okay? Um, elbows, headbutts are illegal, um, but are very often occur because people glance heads or again, you call dirty boxing where you miss with your hand, you can still hit with the elbow behind it and stuff like that, okay? Um, so key characteristics of boxing, right? Um, as we talked about before, uh, the, the things that I think are the most important for us is be, um, the beauty of boxing is a lot of its close range type uh, punches. Your, your hooks, your shovel hooks to the body, your uppercuts, these close in type punches from different angles um, are again, are some of the, is some of, again, the sweet science of boxing. Um, those are very, uh, uh, other, other people, other styles have kind of copied those types of punches. But again, that is what, um, if you ask me, I mean, everybody has a jab, everybody has a, a, you know, a reverse punch or a cross, right? But it's some of the tight hooks and uppercuts that really make, um, boxing, uh, kind of special. And then the unique, and, and people also don't appreciate some of the, the defense aspects of boxing, okay? Just the use of the head movement, being able to move the head a lot, and, and now, you know, again, all martial arts, we talk about, hey, you should really move your face so you don't get hit, right? But boxing is really, you know, your slip, your bob and weave, and things like that have, um, uh, has really, you know, takes that to another level. Um, the use of the shoulders, and we'll play with this in lab when we do it, but like just the idea, okay, we, and, and again, not boxing is the only one, so hey, keep your shoulders, your chin down, your shoulders up to kind of protect, right? I mean, other people say, hey, don't leave with your chin so you can get knocked out, right? But again, boxing really, you know, keeps the tight covers going on and everything as you throw your punches. But like, for example, we have what we call a shoulder roll. Right, so if I can't use my hands to block or move my face, I use, um, uh, if you uh, um, seen or, or, or talked about, um, um, crap, his name just, went out of my head. Uh, he just, he, he boxed Conor McGregor, Floyd Mayer, okay? Um, Merriweather, right? So he's a very good defensive boxer. They talk about um, they talk about his shoulder roll a lot, right? So the punch is coming in, and he'll get his shoulder up so that the, 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 it hits him in the shoulder, not his face, right? So he's protecting his face with his shoulders. Okay, um, your basic cover where we kind of we kind of bleed the pressure off of we take the shot on our arm and and our and here instead of um, uh, you know, again, uh, taking it on the head, that type of thing. So some of their counter or some of their defense in close as well, being able to take shots on other parts of the body besides their face is, is very, is, is very good defensive tactics. Okay. And lastly, just the ability to take a punch, get her, the program to keep coming makes the training methodology very formidable, right? And it's kind of like we talked about Muay Thai. There is, some people would argue they're a little more brutal martial arts, but um, it's hard to argue. If you condition your shin that you can kick whatever you want with it and you're not gonna bat an eye, you can slam your shin into something as hard as you want and it's not gonna, bo and it's not gonna bother you, that makes it pretty, I mean, that makes it you know, pretty formidable as you know, as an opponent, if like they don't care if they what they hit with that leg, right? And boxing the same way. I had a friend who um, training partner way back in the day. He he took second in Golden Gloves. I had other guys that won, but this guy, uh, no, he won. He won um, one year Golden Gloves boxing his weight class for the state of Indiana. And he was talking about he's like, man, it was a rough match. And he's talking about he got punched so hard. He's like, I got hit and all I could do was see white. Like I, I lost, all, all I didn't see, and he was like, what do you do? He's like, I did what my coach told me. I kept moving forward and punching until I found the guy. You had a guy so hard he sees white and once you do, he keeps coming at you. There's something to be said about that. 
Okay? Now, long-term health benefits aside, that's another question, right? But as far as fighting effectiveness, kind of hard to argue with the training methodology that makes you, um, again, that uh, conditioned to being able to take a punch and keep coming. And there's something to be said for that. Okay? All right, so that is boxing. We're going, next we're going to look at Jun Fan Kung Fu. And as a subset of that, then we will talk a little more specifically about Wing Chun, which is a Chinese style. Okay. Jun Fan also known, or you might have heard the phrase JKD, which stands for Jeet Kune Do. This is the martial art of Bruce Lee. Which he developed while basically here in America. Certainly has a lot of Chinese influence, but you could argue is really one of the, the um, main American martial arts. Right, because it developed basically while he was here. Okay. Um, Bruce Lee, Jun Fan is Cantonese for Bruce Lee. When we say Jun Fan, Bruce Kung Fu, what we are really saying is Bruce Lee Kung Fu. Okay. So a lot of people use Jun Fan and Jeet Kune Do concepts as if they were synonymous. And maybe we could make this is maybe be a little semantic, but basically there is a distinction. Chi Kune Do is the way of intersecting fists. It is a philosophy. It is the concept, as Bruce Lee described it. It is the concept of using what works for you personally and rejecting what doesn't. Okay. So the idea was, you know, lots of um, he would try a lot of different martial arts and, again, adopt what was useful for him and reject what was not useful for him. And so a lot of people use that as, oh, as a crutch or as an excuse to basically be dabblers, right? I'm going to get a yellow belt in about six different things, but I don't have really the discipline or the work ethic to stay with anything but I'm, I'm doing what Bruce Lee did. Now, he was a little more dedicated, he was a little more purposeful, you know, with what he was doing, right? Um, than just bouncing around and, and having a hodgepodge of stuff that you learned as a yellow belt and five different things, right? 